This video is brought to you by Storyblocks. As you're probably aware, things have gotten pretty intense on college campuses. Starting with Columbia University in mid-April, students have organized encampments with the overall goal of pressuring universities to divest funds from weapons manufacturers and other corporate interests profiting off the war on Gaza, while also calling for an end to the ongoing genocide. While these protests have largely been nonviolent, the university-endorsed police response has been anything but, though we will not be showing clips here, so uh, you can look those up on your own. Uh, and in fact, the night before we're filming this, several hundred NYPD officers in riot gear descended on Columbia, arresting over 100 protesting students, including some who were occupying a campus building. Meanwhile, a student encampment at UCLA, which is just over there, was attacked by violent counter-protesters. Now, needless to say, um, all of this is upsetting at the basic level of peaceful student protesters shouldn't be violently attacked. And many of these students have not only been arrested, but banned from campus and face expulsion and potential legal ramifications. Um, and even faculty members have been caught in the crossfire. Steve Tamari, a 65-year-old history professor, was violently assaulted by several cops at a Washington University protest. Meanwhile, Emory's philosophy chair, Noelle McAfee, was arrested for intervening when she saw police hitting a student. That one was especially wild to me because not only Am I a former college philosophy professor? Um, I'm familiar with McAfee's work, which deals with theories of democracy and analyzes contemporary political ideology. And there's a quote from her work that's made waves on social media since her arrest, in which she argues that the qualitative difference between public opinion formation and public will formation is that the former only calls on us to opine, to mouth our preferences. The latter calls on us to decide. In other words, political will isn't about sharing opinions on social media, it's about enacting those views. But while all of this is shocking to watch, uh, it's something we've seen routinely since at least the civil rights movement, with college students leading the charge in protests against Jim Crow, the Vietnam War, South African apartheid, and the war in Iraq. And in Europe, students have historically been at the forefront of protest movements that flirted with and even helped catalyze full-on revolutions. But with all this, we might still be asking ourselves, why are universities often at the front lines of American politics? Aren't these students supposedly oversensitive snowflakes hiding out in safe spaces? And why would mild-mannered college professors be putting themselves in harm's way to protect the same students? Now, this whole situation is very much in flux, but Based on what we've seen so far today, I want to consider some of the history and philosophy behind student movements and see if it can help us understand what's going on right now in a calm and sober way that definitely won't make anyone angry with me at all. Please. And because more than ever, this is an in-process conversation, uh, please let us know what you think about all this in the comments. Okay, before we keep going, I wanna tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks. Now, Storyblocks is the complete stock solution. Their curated stock library has everything that you need to create high quality videos, and it's all in one place. You, you got over a million 4K HD clips, you got templates, music, sound effects, images, and more. You can also choose from the thousands of pre-made professional video templates for your favorite editing program, including After Effects, Premiere Pro, Apple Motion, and DaVinci Resolve resolve to take your videos to the next level and speed up your creative workflow. Now you can choose a monthly or annual plan with no hidden or extra fees. And with unlimited downloads, you can easily test out different effects, clips, or tracks to bring your creative vision to life. And new content is added regularly, prioritizing in-demand keywords so you always have what you need to stay current with trends and news. Now, many other stock providers make licensing expensive and complicated. And this is why Storyblocks created two clear-cut licenses with comprehensive coverage so you can get back the time you'd spend waiting through legal jargon and create with confidence. We really love Storyblocks here at Wisecrack. You know, their content library makes what we do a lot easier. There was a time where we were reliant on free stock footage and creative commons footage, and it truly made doing this so much harder. We were scouring the web for hours to find the right thing. It ate up so much of our time. So if you've been in that position, you know that we mean it when we say that using Storyblocks can truly feel like a breath of fresh air. So to get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head to storyblocks.com slash wisecrack, or click the link, it's right there in the description. Okay, let's take a deep breath and get back to figuring out what's going on behind the recent student protests. 
Now, while student protests in the 60s and 70s at American universities get a lot of airspace, the most impressive or terrifying, depending on your point of view, student protests of that era happened in France during May of 1968. They emerged for a variety of reasons, ranging from opposition to the Vietnam War to unpopular campus policies like restrictions around men and women being allowed in each other's dorms and everything in between. Now, what really gave these protests political force was that various workers' unions joined in, leading to a significant amount of the population to participate in actions calling for a fundamental reorganization of society. L'art était descendu dans la rue, l'amour était dans tous les coins de la capitale et on réfléchissait au sens de la vie et à quel type de civilisation on pouvait désormais travailler. According to political theorist Simon Tormey, 1968 represents the inauguration of a politics of refusal. Refusal to be incorporated into dominant narratives. Refusal to conform to a logic of political mobilization that has been practiced for over three centuries. Refusal to deploy the organizational forms so familiar from previous models of collective action. 1968 represented a freeing up of politics from the congealed, stodgy, and unimaginative understandings that had so dogged the emergence of an oppositional politics after the Second World War. It unleashed a wave of joyous experimentation, evanescent and spontaneous efforts to challenge the dull routine of the repetitious lives that had been constructed in and through advanced capitalism. And while writers and academics today overwhelmingly view the events of May 68 positively, at the time the government, the police, and the heavily censored media apparatus, among others, did everything in their power to squash the movement. And this led to police violence, students throwing bricks and building barricades in the streets, and Charles de Gaulle, the president, not the airport, um, to flee the country. In light of the recent arrest of both academics and students, it feels important to note that there was significant overlap uh, between the 1968 protests and academic philosophers and those in the humanities more generally. We've talked a lot over the years about philosophers like Jacques Derrida, Alain Badiou, Jacques Rancière, Etienne Balibar, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Simone de Beauvoir. And to various extents, these thinkers were all adjacent to, participants in, or in full support of the student protesters. And for some of these philosophers, uh, namely Balibar, Ranciere, and Badiou, the specter of 68 shaped their work as a whole, with each in their own way preoccupied with the possibility of radical social and political change, and developing their own theories on things like truth, revolution, and democracy. Now, Jacques Ranciere, who was a philosophy professor during the events of 68, argues that far from being a youth carnival, the May 68 sequence can make us perceive what politics means as a power of collective invention. It is the invention of names that break social identities that are given. The invention of actions that burst apart the mediations that define the consensual order. The transformation of spaces, of their material and symbolic uses. The unfolding of an autonomous and accelerated time. Such inventions are usually thought of as the manifestations of spontaneous an ephemeral revolt. Now, this basically means that what some might see as a horrific mixture of spring break and a Marxist revolution uh, can actually be a space of political invention and creation. Ranciere goes on to write that, but it can easily be ascertained that it is those momentary disruptions of the normal state of things that bring into existence a specific temporality of politics. This does not mean that politics only exists in a few exceptional moments of insurrection. It means that it is as a result of those interruptions of normal police time that there is a history and a tradition of political invention distinct from the history of social forces and state institutions. So basically, Ranciere is arguing that these events create interruptions to the normal state of things that open up new political possibilities. But it wasn't just the younger and, and hipper Parisians that were in on the action, as the slightly out of fashion and a little bit older Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir um, offered enthusiastic public support for the students. As Gabriel Rockhill explains, on May 20, Sartre spoke at the Sorbonne, which had been occupied for a week, expressing his admiration for the movement. Beauvoir also frequented the Sorbonne, attended the discussions, and expressed her hope that the activists would shake the regime and perhaps even bring it down. In June and early July, Sartre published two articles in La Nouvelle Observateur in support of the movement. Shout out to the person who's already critiquing my French pronunciation. You're not wrong. Leave that comment if you want. I'm, I don't care, but you're not wrong. 
Sartre's support makes sense because, as we've noted before, the individualism of his earlier existentialism had transformed into a concern with the way in which society shapes our subjectivity and in which social change involves group activity. Now, he talked about this in terms of our everyday seriality, you know, because uh, in our day to day lives, we're separate individuals without some sort of group identity. Uh, and he talked about how we could transition to acting as a group infusion when we experience some collective problem. Uh, Sartre's famous example is people waiting at a bus stop who transition from serial individuals to a group infusion to collectively respond to the problem of the bus failing to show up. So, so I guess what he's really saying is next time your bus is late, you should start a revolution. Let us know how it goes. This can be a helpful framework for thinking about student protest, as the introduction of some sort of collective problem or issue, uh, in this case students not wanting their tuition money spent funding a war that's indiscriminately killing civilians, uh, seems to have brought disparate individuals together in a new type of group infusion. And as was the case in France over a half century ago, uh, violent crackdowns only seem to rally more folks to the cause. Now in America, this same phenomena has happened over and over again on campuses ever since the civil rights movement. But of course, this still doesn't quite get at why university campuses are so ripe for this kind of collective action. So something I often think about is how it's easy to be apolitical when politics don't seem to directly affect your life. Um, this may be a silly example, but in high school, I at one point didn't really think there was a big difference in the candidates for an upcoming election. Uh, shouts to everyone who remembered Bush v. Gore. Special shout out to anyone who voted in that one. Uh, but I had a friend from a really different, you know, cultural and economic background, and they helped me realize that actually, um, all my dad's golf buddies were wrong about politics and basically, basically everything else other than that Miller Lite is a superior American light beer. This video is not sponsored by Miller Lite, but if they wanted to, I'd be into it. And if you guys complained about that sponsorship, I would just be like, come on, let your boy get a buzz on. But the point here is that we often don't question our own social and political assumptions until we're forced to realize those beliefs and assumptions aren't universal. I had something like this happen well, not about politics, but when I moved to England and, and you know, I would go to bars sometimes, um, I realized that you don't just walk up to the bar like we do here in America. Uh, and I quickly learned that our former colonial overlords prefer you to stand in the queue before you get your warm beer. Now, at a basic level, college campuses are, at their best, a hotbed for having your assumptions questioned. They're spaces where people from diverse cultural, social, and intellectual backgrounds can gather together to hang out, talk about ideas, play video games, read books, all without their whole lives being centered around becoming productive members of the economy. Um, and I know a lot of us work when we're in college. I did it. It sucked. Um, but I still think there's a difference between part-time work during college and the feeling of like living on a campus and being in that little bubble. And for many people, this is the last time in life that we exist in such a diverse space, as you might graduate and enter a workplace filled with people who more or less reflect your background, or move to neighborhoods where everyone more or less looks the same. Like here at Wisecrack, all my employees are slightly, um, you know, decayed looking bald men. And in my neighborhood, everyone too has the same sort of gray, sheen of death to them and and no hair on top of their heads but uh they all wear they all wear bright colors so it's fun you know it, it distracts you from that look of, of impending annihilation but to speculate slightly it seems that this mix of intellectual and cultural diversity coupled with the time and space to think and explore ideas topped off with the lack of immediate workplace and economic pressure creates a sense of imagination and optimism one not often achievable for those of us busy worried about rising rent payments and job insecurity and the recent divorce of the golden bachelor in susan sontag's essay about spending two weeks in vietnam in 1968 she reflects on how her experiences shifted her perception of student protest movements like those in Paris. Um, I think it's a quote worth reading at length. Shout out to our guy, Michael Luxembourg, for quickly identifying this quote. You know, this, this is this is for you, bud. Uh, so Sontag writes, I recognized a limited analogy to my present state in Paris in early July when talking to acquaintances who had been on the barricades in May, I discovered that they don't really accept the failure of their revolution. 
The reason for their lack of realism, I think, is that they're still possessed by the new feelings revealed to them during those weeks. Those precious weeks in which vast numbers of ordinarily suspicious, cynical, urban people, workers and students, behaved with an unprecedented generosity and warmth and spontaneity toward each other. You know, basically she's saying that these students were provided the space to be unrealistic which let them operate with an intellectual imagination and social spontaneity not encouraged or even accepted in the real world. She goes on to write, In a way, then, the young veterans of the barricades are right in not altogether acknowledging their defeat and being unable fully to believe that things have returned to pre-May normality, if not worse. Actually, it is they who are being realistic. Someone who has enjoyed new feelings of that kind, a reprieve however brief from the inhibitions on love and trust this society enforces is never the same again. In him, the revolution has just started and it continues. But still, the question might remain, why is broader society so focused on the college campus as a specific site of political action? Um, and in a recent essay, uh, it's called The Campus Does Not Exist by Samuel P. Catlin. I really recommend you read this one. We'll, we'll throw a link down there. Um, but he writes about the history and use of the idea of the campus and how this plays into our current moment. Now, he starts by noting the irony that at a time when people increasingly seem to not give two sh about the university, whether that be the treatment of faculty and staff, uh, the censoring of curriculums, or massive debts taken on by students, they care a whole lot about what happens on campus. Now, in the essay, and at this part, he's talking about the work of theorist Lee Edelman. Callan argues that in many ways, the campus represents a space of control and safety for an imagined and fantasized student that's more or less just a child. Quote, the fantasy of the campus appears as an allegory of the nation state. The future of the nation itself is taken to be at stake in what happens on campus. Both nation and campus are supposed to be securely bounded to keep safe the child. In both cases, this safety proves impossible to guarantee. And this ineluctable exposure to violence, to liability, to non-affiliates spikes the panic. When there is campus unrest, panic flares because the campus is supposed to be where unrest does not happen, where the child is safe from reality. Panic nudges both campus and nation toward ever more extreme, ever more militarized practices. Aesthetics finally subordinated to terror borders checkpoints. Basically, the safety of the children on campus is so important that sometimes we must reposition those children as non-affiliates or outsiders so that they can be punished and controlled to protect those children who are still affiliated. If that sounds like it doesn't make a lot of sense, I, I think it's because, well, that logic doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and this really taps into the spirit of May 68, in which students rallied against their own infantilization under a patriarchal society, in which they didn't have the intellectual, political, or sexual freedom of adults. As philosopher Etienne Balibar explains, another aspect generated a rebellious or even a revolutionary spirit among the 68th generation of students, which was the manner in which a pedagogy based on discipline reinforced the patriarchic and paternalistic model of dependency, the rigid system of authority that preserves the type of bourgeois family relations even in non-bourgeois families. Basically, if you treat college students like little kids and then you act like their strict daddy, well, eventually, just like a real kid would, they're going to rebel. So does any of this help us understand what's happening right now? Honestly, I'm not totally sure. You can let me know if this has helped you. Uh, and in one sense, that's because as we discussed in our previous video on protest, we often can't evaluate the efficacy or the ethics of these things until after the fact. Um, in another sense, it's because we are still very much in the middle of things right now. We're so in the middle that in between writing and then editing and filming this script, things took extreme terms at both Columbia and UCLA. You know, this morning over coffee, I watched videos of students being pushed down staircases by police and, and beaten by counter protesters. Not fun. I normally like to listen to jazz while I drink coffee. But one thing we can do is consider how the student movements of the past were treated and discussed during their own time. 
Consider the massive unpopularity of the Vietnam War protest. After the National Guard opened fire and killed four students at Kent State in 1970, a Newsweek poll found that 56% of Americans agreed with the action and blamed the students for the tragedy. The following year, only 18% of Americans supported the anti-war demonstrations. Clearly, hindsight offers perspective as today, the protests of that era are widely lauded for their revolutionary spirit. Now, whether it's the eventual acknowledgement that the Vietnam War was a horrible idea, uh, the celebration of Nelson Mandela after years of the US classifying him as a terrorist, or the way in which centrist politicians now openly admit that the invasion of Iraq was based on false evidence. In almost all these cases, we collectively look back upon the actions of student protesters as being largely in the right. It's at least safe to say that just as these events shape the political and philosophical imaginations of past generations, this current wave of campus protest has the potential to shift the discourse around the economic entanglement of the university with the war industry. And because this video isn't trying to manufacture a neatly packaged conclusion, I'm gonna leave you with one of the slogans spray painted all over Paris during the events of May 68. Be realistic demand the impossible. And hey, if you want to hear more about some of these philosophers and how they've talked about protest, uh, check out our recent video on protest. There should be a link here. In general, thank you so much for hanging out. A special shout out to all our patrons. We appreciate your support. If you want to join, there's a link in the description. But thanks for watching, commenting, engaging with this stuff. It really means a lot. And thank you so much for, you know, having the space to let us talk about tricky issues like this. It means a lot. Um, please let us know what you think. And I'll see you guys soon.